Welcome back to the Emetophobia Free Podcast. I'm very excited to introduce Claire Gildersleeve, who's here with us today. Hello, Claire. Hello. <laughs> Claire is an ex-emetophobe. Mm -hmm. She's also a teacher. So our today's podcast is going to be all about teaching and how emetophobia shows up in teaching, how it can affect and impact your job. But Claire is also one of our coaches. So lots to talk about, lots to share. And I'm really excited, first of all, to hear Claire's story because Claire, I've, I've I think I have met you a couple of mm -hmm. times, yeah. but I've actually never heard your story. So do you want to tell us about emetophobia, yeah. teaching, where that fits yeah. for you? Yeah. So I, just to start off, not about the teaching bit, but just generally my emetophobia. So I, I had emetophobia as long as I could remember, really. I think probably yeah. the first time I remember being really panicky about being yeah. sick was when I was five. Um, and then, yeah, throughout oh. childhood, my sister was like, anytime anyone was sick, you would scream bloody murder in the house. <laughs> Just, you know, yeah. I remember being very, very aware of it. Um, yes. And, you know, throughout teenagehood, I, I did stuff. I didn't kind of, you know, I, I was fortunate that I didn't kind of hold back from doing too much. Yeah. Although I would leave nights early um, if I thought it was getting a bit messy. I would um, I would avoid a few things if, you know, yeah. I felt that was a bit too risky. Um, yeah. And then, you know, kind of through adulthood, I thought really I'd just be stuck with it. And that was it. I remember yeah. when the internet first started and, <laughs> and I, was, I had access to look and kind of see on forums there was information about emetophobia but I just thought it was going to be something that was stuck because you know like probably still is the case now a lot of the information isn't yeah. isn't particularly helpful um yeah I remember one of the things I remember reading was about exposure therapy and it said um you know the last step is to go and volunteer in a local hospital to hold a sick bulb for a stranger now right. I don't know anyone a metaphobia or not who would particularly want to do that no um let alone if you don't know how to manage that um yeah so um so yeah thought I'd kind of be stuck with it and then yeah. actually my coach was somebody I went to school with who I didn't mm. really know that well at school but she was in kind of one of the other social groups um oh, wow. and when I'd spoken to a, a friend, another friend, kind of a mutual friend, and she'd said, oh, you know, um, this person does does coaching in that kind of thing, in overcoming emetophobia. And I looked into it, bought the book first, started yeah. reading the book, thought, oh, my God, this is actually making sense. This is, this yes. is really good. And then as, actually, I know quite a lot of people do, I know a lot of my clients have done, kind yeah. of falling off a bit with the, with the book, got busy, um, yeah. And then didn't really kind of see it through. And then in lockdown, I think I'd kind of seen something somewhere again. And it was, yeah. I just thought it was a really good time to do it. I'd had a previous yeah. very um, significant bereavement like three years before. And right. I think dealt with that pretty well. But during then lockdown, because it was quite sudden as well, yeah. I started to worry a lot about the health of people that I cared about and loved um yes. and so really I did I did this, actually did the general program but with a real focus on emetophobia because I wanted to Gosh. kind of have that real I felt like I was probably quite a positive person quite you know yeah. Kind of in yeah. some ways thriving but I had that emetophobia and then really wanted to kind of get rid of that and then yes. fine-tune a few other things as well so so yeah I did the program with a coach in the um summer August holidays when nice. after that locked first lockdown and then yeah I overcame my metaphobia within eight weeks fabulous. so after what 33 yes. years yeah yeah <laughs> fabulous love it okay so let's talk teaching then that's mm -hmm. what this podcast is about we're both teachers Claire you teach what age group is you were you 14 you? to 18 year olds I teach 14 so, to yeah. 18 fabulous so very different to myself I was primary school so I was 5 to 11 yeah. um very different age groups and but there are common threads throughout teaching aren't there that we can discuss yeah. and how emetophobia might impact those mm -hmm. things so do you want to talk about how emetophobia shaped your teaching experience yeah. while you had it yeah I mean I think firstly it was I didn't go straight into teaching I you know I did my my degree was in theatre design so I did kind of a few years nice. of freelance and I kind of always thought I'd quite like to do teaching and then I did a few projects where I was working with um 
with students with young people um and kind of in school settings as well doing kind of set design and getting them to help with stuff and I really enjoyed that um but to be honest for me primary would have never been in the picture I was like (laughs) because I have something I could recall or recreate as I know now such kind of vivid um recollections of every time somebody was sick in school so to me primary schools are just places that are full of (laughs) full of it Um, yeah lovely yeah and we we had to do um before before the starting the pgc we had to do a week in a primary school which i really yeah. enjoyed lots of aspects of it but i think every day i was just thinking oh my god just let me get through this day without yes you know having any incidents um yeah. and yeah so that just really reinforced for me that you know that was going to be a really kind of something that that wouldn't have worked well, very well for me yeah. um i was yeah. too anxious about that you know and i kind of i I sold it to myself, the secondary school teaching and the fact that secondary school students are a bit older to know if they're going to feel sick and perhaps yes. deal with it themselves. Make it to the low, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, okay. yeah, so that's that's kind of going into that. Um, yeah. You know, it's inter- it was so interesting to me doing my coaching training for Thrive. Yes. And yes. hearing about how much of a secret phobia rheumatophobia is, because for me... Every single job I've been in, if, whether it's yeah. teaching or not, everywhere I've been, ev- anyone that knows me knew that I had a yeah. metaphobia because right. it's my way of being able to control it to kind of say, look, you know about this, you know I can't yeah. deal with this. Can't so if anybody needs to feel sick or if anybody yeah. does that, you, you need to be the ones that manage it and I'll be yes. running away in the corner somewhere. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, which wasn't a luxury I had, Claire, to be honest, because you can't no. tell four year olds that you've got a fear of being sick. Yeah. <laughs> you can't you can't do it. I think the um yeah, I get asked that quite a lot. It's like, well, how how were you a primary school teacher with a mm-hmm. metaphobia? Um and the answer I think is with great difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I was. Yeah. Every day was like like it was for you in that week on edge and tense particularly in the winter mm. um it was very very stressful environment or pressured environment to be in with the metaphobia because children of that age mm. don't understand some of the time about their bodily sensations and what means what and whether they are hungry and they, they say they feel sick quite a lot and some of them are sick when they get too hot or they eat too mm. much or they eat too quickly yeah. um it's you know it's I'd say it's relatively frequent, but it's certainly not as frequent as most people on the outside perceive it to be. So when you, I was in a metaphobe in the situation when I was teaching, I zoned in on the times when children were sick or the times the children felt sick. And I brooded about that and I played it over and over in my mind. But I didn't do that for all the days when nobody was Mm. and I taught reception for a lot of years as well so the really little ease Mm. and there was days and weeks and sometimes months where nobody was sick yeah but that's not something that's zoned in and that's not something that's talked about and that's certainly not something or a story that I told myself Mm -hmm. and that's important so if you are a primary school teacher out there or somebody considering primary teaching with a metaphobia know that the the reality of the situation is yes it's probably more frequent than a secondary school but it's certainly not an everyday occurrence it's yeah. not something that's there yeah. all of the time well that's something that's, generally isn't it and as an emetophobe yeah. you imagine those sort of scenarios every single day you know yes. I spend yes. an hour and a half on the tube each day when I'm going into school because I work yes. in North London and teach in South London and yeah. you know every single journey I'll be looking around going okay yeah. when's it going to happen who looks yeah. tired or who looks unwell yes. and you yes. know the amount of time you spend worrying it about it yeah. is so disproportionate yes. to, yes. to the potential risk you know and absolutely and actually, I finished working with a primary school teacher a few weeks Have ago you? and who's now over her metaphobia which is great and, yeah and, you know, and she again it's the same kind of thing of she's just like oh, I just it, I don't I kind of have those worries about it anymore it's just no you know understanding yes. that you'll cope with it if it happens yes. but it isn't yes. something that has to take up all your minds sp- well a lot of your mind space every day no absolutely not and I think you brought up social anxiety there and that wasn't a factor for you in your emetophobia it was a huge factor for me it was massive mm. because I didn't tell anybody for the majority of my life and the people that I did tell were very very close family mm. so I was in a metaphobe teaching a primary school when nobody knew that I was scared of children being sick or myself being sick or any anything to do with it at all. And that's incredibly 
lonely and isolating and it's I, I've explained it previously like a, a swan on the surface so I was very calm on the surface mm. I looked very calm looked very in control but my little legs were doing this all of the time mm. underneath the surface yeah. continuously apart from when there was sick to deal with now I was a very driven I was I am a very driven person very ambitious person and I wanted to climb that career ladder as quickly as I possibly could um, and I was going for it hell for leather every day I was showing up I was doing more than expected I was really going for it as metaphobes tend to be driven don't they and successful so I was really going for it but it was like my Achilles heel because I couldn't I felt I couldn't let anybody in on that I couldn't let anybody know because that would be seen as a weakness Mm. and I spent all my time portraying the fact that I could handle it throw anything at me I am the problem solver I will deal with it throw it at me throw it at me throw it at me I'll absorb it but I knew that if that was something that was thrown at me that I couldn't now thankfully it got it not thankfully at all but I was able to speak to my head teacher at the time because it got to the point where I was severely underweight because I wasn't eating at all in school I was just taking a bottle a sealed bottle of water with me wasn't eating anything my hands were dry and cracked and it was very obvious that something wasn't right so I had to speak to him and I sort of poured my heart out if you will and so I said I, you know I'm, I'm still going to be really good at my job and I remember prefacing it without I can still do my job yeah. I can still <laughs> I just if somebody's sick I just can't I can't handle yeah. it um but the reception that I was met with was one of total understanding oh. real compassion mm. and he actually said well I'll tell you what I've got a phobia of and went Bleh, and told me his his story which yeah. is not a metaphobia but it was something you know yeah. very personal to him and it was such a, a relief and a weight off my shoulders just to be able to share that with somebody yeah. because it had such a massive impact on my job. Mm. When in, in primary teaching, the, obviously they say any teaching, safeguarding is paramount. You've got to keep those kids safe first and foremost. Yeah. And when they're little, they need that more than ever because they, yeah. they climb on things and they try and mm-hmm. escape. But <laughs> right? so they're four and five year olds. You've got to keep those kids safe. Now, I remember once I was in class and my TA had just nipped out. I think she'd just gone to the library, which was just around the corner in the same and this in the same building, literally around a corner. And one of the children was sick. And what went through my mind was, I can't go over and see if that child's sick. Okay. Yeah. I cannot be anywhere near yeah. them. I've got to remove myself, but there's yeah. no other adult in this room. So yeah. I stayed, I had my game face on, and all teachers will know the game face. Yeah. Right? So you're going, ah, <laughs> but your face is going, it's okay, kids, come away, come yeah. on, right? <laughs> you know, I had that on. I was I was acting away beautifully, but my heart was pounding, I was mm-hmm. sweating, I was shaking, and I had I literally had my back to the door and I was banging like this on the door. Oh. And I was thinking, please come back, please come back. I <laughs> think so she was called Jill, yeah. lovely lady called Jill. And eventually she did. And then she was able to take over. And I had to leave the room at that point because I was getting myself to like a panic attack state. Um, So I I was able to keep the kids safe, but not in the way that I'd want to. Mm. If one of them had banged their heads, for example, or was having a seizure even, I'd be in there. I'd be sorting it out. I'd be on my hands and knees. I couldn't do that. Yeah. It was it was way too much. Yeah. I had a couple of things like that where so, you know, firstly, that that kind of thing of telling everyone extended to the Mm. students as well. So every Mm. new class I had for a decade in my first lesson with them, I must have seemed real normal. (laughs) I was like, by the way, I have this phobia. (laughs) Um, I can't cope with people being sick. So if you ever feel sick in any of my lessons, run. I won't tell you off. Just go somewhere (laughs) else. Go to the toilet. Go to the medical room. I'm not going to... Far away. (laughs) And actually, I must have had lovely students because none of them took the mickey out of that, oh, that kind of yeah. or, or kind of took advantage of it or anything like oh, that so um yeah I've got lovely students um but <laughs> yeah. um you know it was just I just thought I have to tell them immediately when I meet mm. them because what if in their second lesson they're sick and they yes. don't know to kind of keep it away yes. from me so yeah so I would be like I was like I'd have a panic attack but you mm. know I don't think I ever had a a full-on full-blown panic attack you know as I I know how serious panic attacks could be but the you know the jelly legs the shaking sweating feeling completely out of control of stuff that kind of panic absolutely you know yeah 
just if someone coughed near me and I thought it might be them being sick, I would be yes. starting it, you know. Um, but yeah. we had obviously been, you know, kind of teaching the age group we teach and I teach art, which is a lovely subject to teach. But, yes. you know, we go on trips abroad to Europe to go and look at art galleries lovely. and things like that. And there's been a few of those trips that, you know, as we've kind of gone through and I've become more experienced, I've been in, responsible for and I've had yeah. to just delegate anything like that when a student's done well to a, to yes. a colleague because I just, yes. they, well, they all know that I couldn't deal with it. So they would keep yeah. it away from me. There was one situation where we were in Berlin and one of the students, if I'm being honest, I think he'd probably had a bit of a cheeky drink the night before. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we said they didn't. I, I didn't have that problem. <laughs> 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 um, I I've been sick once for alcohol in my yeah. whole life. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was 27. So <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, he... I did, because they'd kept it away from me so well that he was feeling yeah. unwell, I had no idea until I was sitting kind of a bit opposite him on the, like, Berlin, what's it called, the something barn, the the underground. Okay, um, yeah. I saw him kind of not looking very well and then pulling out a plastic bag, and I tell you, I ran. <laughs> they were like, gone. I just she gone? ran to the other side of the carriage <laughs> and turned into the corner of the wall I was just like I can't look I can't look and like put headphones in I was just like that yeah it. Um, but you know, I had another the first ever trip abroad I did and I was only yeah. been teaching for a couple of years by that point there was a student who had to fly home early for a safeguarding reason um okay. you know which to be honest I felt quite competent in dealing with until yeah. we were at the airport and she's like I feel like I'm going to be sick. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm on my mm. own. With and I can't do anything mm. for her. So yeah. you know, I was just, and it's so hard, isn't it? Because I think I'm such an empathetic, sympathetic yes. person. I really yes. love to kind of nurture them. And I was just like, yeah. you're just going to have to go and do all of it on your yeah. own. I can't yeah. like, come with you. I'll like, help you. And yes. you know, at the time, fortunately for, for me, it was quite a quiet flight that we were coming back on. So I could just sit yes. in the row behind her and think right if she's sick I'm gonna at least be a bit away from it yeah but it's it is that thing isn't it like you say you really want to look after your students and do everything you can for them and you feel like you can in every other aspect but that one aspect is the thing where I just and I think that's why I felt so much that I wanted to tell all my colleagues as well so that they knew that that was the one thing everything else I do I remember in a a different job not you know not teaching but they sent me on a first aid course and I was like I can do it if anyone cuts yep. their arm off fine yeah fine do it if they say they feel sick yeah. <laughs> so yeah. no I won't be around in that situation yeah. um yeah but yeah so it's 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 really tough isn't it I have another one mm. another school it does tend to happen on these school trips um <laughs> well in again but in a different year group and oh no it's Barcelona and they um <laughs> They, uh, this student, male student, so firstly, there would have been a safeguarding issue with that anyway. Yeah. For some reason, despite the fact that they all knew that I had a phobia, knocked on my door in the middle of the night, because yeah. we were all in this kind of hostel in this, in this long corridor, and said, I think I'm going to be sick. I don't want to do it in our communal bathroom. Can I use your bathroom? And I was like, nope. No. No. <laughs> well, safeguarding, I wouldn't have been allowed to just let a student no. in my room. Um, no. But I was really as a non-emetophobe I'd be like okay yep. look don't worry we'll take you back into your room yes we'll it out. I'll go and get the um colleague who's a first aider but yeah. I was like no you have to go you know I can't deal with it go and knock yeah. on the door of the technician who's the who's yes. the um safeguard or the not safeguard and first aider and yeah they'll deal with it I then closed yep. the door I didn't even wait to check that they did it and they were okay oh, I God. felt so like I couldn't manage it and couldn't yes. see yes. it or couldn't hear it or couldn't be in control of myself if, if I yes. did that yeah. I just all empathy went out the door it was absolutely crazy. absolutely and it's it's so at odds isn't it with as you were saying you, you know that you can look after your students in every other capacity yeah. and you would do anything mm. and you know I was I, I got to a stage where I was assistant head and then ultimately head of school by the time I left, but I was assistant head teacher and I, and I had this real problem solver kind of attitude about me. I was like, I will do anything. Yeah. I will, you know, I will help the cleaner mm. clean anything. I will go and 
empty that PE cupboard that's full of spiders. I will do yeah. any job under the sun, but I will not clean up sick. Yeah. Now, I think my low self-esteem played into that a lot because mm. I didn't see that as acceptable. So, you know, if I was managing a whole team of people and I was saying, you know, they were going, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And if somebody had come to me with, you know, held a mirror up and said, this is what you're doing on a daily basis. This is what you're prepared to do. This is what you give. And that one thing there at this moment in time, and you're working on it, but at this moment in time, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. There would never have been a, well, you're slacking, you know, good at your job. None of that stuff that I beat myself up with, the fact that I wasn't able to be like superwoman and do everything. Mm -hmm. I would never expect that of anybody else. Yes, I did of myself. And I beat mm-hmm. myself up for that something rotten because I was like, well, why can't I? I should be able yeah. to. This should be something that I can manage. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an that's important as well to know that mm-hmm. you give everybody else grace. And as a teacher, your job is to mm-hmm. look after and to nurture and to be empathetic towards and to be kind and yeah. warm. Yeah. But then that often doesn't transfer to yourself when you're in a yeah. metaphor, but it's yeah. the fact it doesn't transfer to yourself. Yeah. Well, I remember once speaking to a colleague in a different job, again, not teaching, when I was working in theatre, and in fact, there was a couple of them, and they were like, oh, yeah, we've both got that phobia as well. In fact, I should yeah. get in touch with them and be like, you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I remember, and actually, unusual, well, I say unusually, it was a guy, one of them, which it, right. it is more unusual, isn't it's, it? Yes, yeah, it is more unusual. You yeah. know, you kind of, it's something like 90% female, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and metaphobes yeah. for various reasons. Um, but he was like, he said, I don't know if it's that I don't have empathy. I think I actually have too much empathy about it he said because it makes me feel really sad for a person if they're if they're feeling yes. sick or if they're being sick so maybe there is a bit of that in there as well but it obviously it's just that one thing that we feel or felt powerless yes. about you yes. know yes. everything else Absolutely. fine but that is the one area that you just don't have that perspective definitely definitely I think a, another if we're thinking about teaching in general no matter what age group something that really sticks out to me that lends itself almost to teaching yeah. and a metaphobia's desire for control. Yeah. yeah. So as a teacher, you've got to be in control, yeah. <laughs> right? Behavior, behavior management as a starting point, you're the one that's leading that ship. You're the one in charge. You're the one that's driving it. We're going this way. We're going that way, kids. We're doing this. We're doing that. You've got to put all that effort into the paperwork side of things that yeah. takes such a long time. And it's, a, it's, important because I've worked with a couple of teachers through coaching and they were apprehensive and other people not just teachers actually people who are ambitious their worry is that by going through the Thrive program Mm -hmm. and tackling your desire for control you're going to lose that ambition and you're going to lose they they kind of attribute their success Mm -hmm. to that drive and that and that desire for control and that brood inside of things I suppose perfectionism they attribute their success to that yeah. and therefore they think by tackling that they're going to lose it yeah. and they're going to become lazy and they're, they're going to not put the effort into the mm-hmm. job and therefore not succeed you know yeah. in their goals um and I think that's an important thing to say that's not the case you don't lose no. your ability to manage you don't lose your ability to succeed and to excel in things if you want to what you do get, though, is the ability to hone your skill. So yeah. you could say, right, well, I'm going to apply it in that area mm-hmm. and I'm not going to apply it over there because over there is not helpful. Yeah. Whereas when you're in a metaphor, you don't understand that that's what's going on. So you're just mm-hmm. applying it across the board, this desire for control, yeah. which is really unhelpful. Well, the, the clarity that you have, you know, if you're not always on the lookout, because it's also like, as we've kind of spoken about, the you know, that amount of thought that that takes up, you're yes. free in all of that brain space for the yes. things that actually you want to be doing. So yes. I'm not yes. now looking around my classroom going, mm, who doesn't look well? Or oh, they said they <laughs> pale, funny tummy. <laughs> Do I need to keep an eye on them? I actually had a, um, a case probably about two months ago now, six weeks, eight weeks ago, um, where a student said to me, oh, I really feel sick. And this was probably yeah. about half an hour before the end of a two hour lesson in the afternoon. Right. Um, yep. and um, I said well what you know firstly how I would have reacted before would have yes. got as I said to go right okay you know I can't deal with that just go out, out to the medical room <laughs> or go to the toilet and someone yep. go with her so that you know you're not on your own fine but yep. you know don't just get it away from me mm. um, 
I would have then been worried about whether it was yeah. something that we both had in the canteen at lunchtime, not yeah, this in yeah. the canteen, uh, no. or, <laughs> or whether it was um, a germ or whether we'd touched the same yeah. handle, all of that yes. kind of stuff, yeah, whether yeah, anyone yeah, else yeah. in the class might have picked something up and then I'd get yeah. something. To be honest, for me, I think I might have already said this, the, the biggest thing was other people being sick. So right. that was my, you know, I know that's quite different to lots of people. I know people yeah. have it in all different kinds of ways. Yep, yep, there's yep. Lots of common things in emetophobia, yes. aren't there? But they're also yes. kind of significant. Yes, different. nuances, yep. But for me, my biggest fear was other people because, again, okay. I thought, I can't control that. I know if I feel yes. sick, I know what I need to yes. do. And again, yes. it's so rare that you have a, are sick. Felt sick every day, though, probably because of course, I yes, about it. Um, yep. But how I did respond this time was just to go, okay, what do you think you need? Do you think you need some fresh air? Do you need to go nice. to the toilet? Do you want to go to the medical room, or do you want to just kind of sit and carry on with stuff? And just like, I think I'll just sit and carry on with stuff for a bit. Lovely. I've forgotten about it ten minutes later. Well, a few, a couple of minutes later, thirty seconds Fabulous. later, so I've moved on to the next student to kind of go through their work with them and you know kind of help them but then when we we had to move to a different room just across the corridor about you know 20 minutes later and then as we went into the corridor I kind of clocked her and said how are you feeling she's like I think I might go and get some fresh air now and I said okay that's fine but again it it was brilliant it had gone into my head I I asked her what she needed and then it had gone again it not I didn't wasn't kind of wouldn't have been caring towards her but it wasn't playing on my mind certainly fabulous. fabulous and then we went the rest of us went into this other room and then a student another kind of colleague as as we were leaving at the end of the lesson had was in the office next door and he came out and he's like oh one of your students has just been sick on the stairs and stairs right, right. Next to where we were talking and I was just like oh I was like oh bless her do you want me to, is there anything I can do do you need me to yeah. go and sort it out yeah I mean again I would have yeah never <laughs> I, would have been like, I would have been like nope I'm running I've nope. got to go to the other side of the building I have to stay away from it but yep. I didn't have any panic about it I, nope. I didn't choose because I didn't have to go past that bit I didn't choose to go yep. and step over it or anything like that yep. but our cleaners on their way um I actually went the other way around to see if I could see where the student was walking over to the other side of the building yeah but when I went up to the office and said, oh, one of our students was sick on the stairs, they all went, ooh. <laughs> and I thought, yes. you know what? That's a normal reaction. It's a I, normal I've reaction. A, in fact, I've had a better than normal reaction because I didn't yes. kind of go, ooh, as soon as he ooh, yeah. Um, yes. So, you know, that was, that was a really good indication to me that I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm over it. It's not, there's no yes. problem there anymore. Absolutely. Right. Fabulous. Yeah. It's lovely when you have those moments. Mine was slightly different to that but I have you heard of PGL I don't know if you'll take yeah. that age kids to PGL I when I was so, at school yeah going and doing right it. yeah yeah so I used to go every year to PGL or most years anyway and at the height of my metaphobia the thought of eating in the canteen now I don't know you know much about it but it's it's like um, a big buffet almost and the kids come in and you have outdoor you do have outdoor taps where you kind of wash your hands and then go in but all of the knives and forks are in you know troughs and you just everyone digs yeah. in gets their hands in <laughs> their hands in the hands in the knives and forks bit yeah goes and gets the food sits down and there's hundreds you know mm. schools upon schools and hundreds of kids all going through the same thing all picking up the same food all using the same knives and forks and I couldn't get my head around that height of metaphobia yeah. and I told my head teacher at this time I said I can't go because I won't be able to eat. Mm. <laughs> and he was like, mm, but you do, we, we need you because of, you know, staffing yeah. and things like this. So what actually ended up happening was I took a mini fridge and I plugged it in in my room and I ate cheese sandwiches for three days, oh, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah. Um, I know, which didn't have a very good effect on my digestive system. Yeah. Didn't move very quickly after that, yeah. I have to I, I admit. But even things like going to... Um, rafting we go on the river and, and go rafting then we get you know splash all the kids and they get in the water I said I couldn't do that because I didn't know that the water was clean I might I might get some water in my mouth and then I might be yeah. sick from that and that was the height of the emetophobia so I did go and I did do it but I was extremely uncomfortable and I didn't mm-hmm. enjoy any of it yeah but then once I'd overcome it PGL time rolled around and they said Jelly you're coming this year I was like yeah I was like do you know what 
I'm going to eat. And I did. And I went into the canteen and the food was really nice. <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit, I was like, well, all of these kids and I was watching them and I was like, well, I'm just eating with yeah. these knives and forks. I'm just carrying on with these kids. Mm. I'm getting in that water. I'm going for it. And it's such a liberating feeling mm. to be able to do your job the way you want to be able yeah. to do your job because yeah. it's hard work, isn't it? It's frustrating yeah. when you know yeah. you want to do something but you're stopping yourself or you can't do it at that moment. Did you did you have to go on a coach trip to go there as well? Yes. See, yes. That, that was out for me. Like I, the yeah. only time I ever did any coach trips was because I work at the Brit School and we're actually yes. doing private Brit, which is great. So yes, it is. I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, I, um, we get to go to the Brit Awards, which is a really nice oh, trip. Every nice, year. yeah. And, you know, it's not a huge long coach journey. It's probably about you know, through the traffic, it's probably about an hour and a half or just over yeah. an hour to get from Selhurst up to Greenwich to the O2. And I, when I, you said, oh, do you want to think of some examples of how kind of a metaphobia affected you in teaching? I was actually having dinner yeah. with a friend who knew me since university. We went to university together and then we both ended yeah. up training as teachers and we both got jobs at the Brit School. So oh, nice. Really nice. So every time we had something like that, she was my safety net because she knew full well what my metaphobia yeah. was like. So I yeah. would make sure, I would always be like, can I be on a coach for Olivia? I need yes. to make sure I'm, you know, kind of with someone that knows the situation. And she yeah. said that to me, she said, you did it, you got through it. She said, but it was a clear hindrance to your enjoyment of yes. it. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I would be sitting at the front of the coach, headphones in, yeah, just, because to me, I just associate a coach journeys yes. with someone's going to be sick at some point. Absolutely, and then often there was someone saying, "Oh, I feel a bit unwell." Yeah. Sometimes, I guess, yes. not every single yeah. time. No. But again, like you were saying at the beginning, I would have focused on those times and yes. gone, "Well, that's yes. it." Coach journeys always make people sick, so absolutely, so therefore, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. So we had, yeah. you know, we had um, a department trip to go down to Cornwall to the university down there in Falmouth and the Eden project and I was just like I've just I won't go on that because no I just felt like I couldn't that felt too much yeah. of a stretch for me unfortunately yes. I've not had any chances because the um the trips to the Brit Awards don't happen on a on a weekday anymore now so we make our own way <sighs> I don't, haven't had to go on a coach yet the coach but I will look forward to the next time something like yes. that comes up and I can yeah. I can do that that kind of want to prove that you can do it is yeah. quite addictive, can't it? Addictive. <laughs> After my first, like within a couple of weeks of finishing the Thrive Programme, I remember, yeah. and perhaps not everybody in my department knew that I'd done it and was okay with it. Yeah. And um, a colleague came down to me at the end of the day or towards the end of the day, I was doing some marking, but he still had a lesson on and he was like, Claire, I know you don't like sick. And I was like, it's yeah. fine. I'm all right with it. <laughs> he was like, I've got a girl in my class who's gone to the toilet to be sick. Yeah. But obviously I yeah. can't go in there and check in on her because, course, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm a man and I can't go in the, men the girls' toilets. So I was like, it's fun. Before we even finished the sentence, I was like, my ah. in the corner. I'm like, fine, I've got this. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I had zero hesitation. I walked no. into that room that that um just guy like, kind of pushed the door open not yeah. even a heart skip or anything like that no. or any panic no and you know by the time I got in there she'd stopped being sick she was just kind of on the floor with her kind of head on the toilet which is lovely yeah um beautiful that you want to be but I didn't, <laughs> yeah, didn't rush to get out of there I asked her how no. she was I asked her if she needed anything right it's so far away from what that would have been you know really Absolutely. really I, I mean I wouldn't have done any of it they, I just yes. they wouldn't have been able to drag me to her like and I would yes, have been absolutely saying, what have you been in what's she been touching what has she been in our yes. toilet <laughs> you know yes been, of course constantly on my mind I tell you what I floated home that night I was just like, <laughs> like I've done it. it I've done it and I, I <laughs> was really grateful to have that opportunity to prove that only a couple of weeks yes. after finishing the program so when I think yes. like 12 weeks before that yeah I would not have managed absolutely that. not no, no. I think there's a, a slight difference in my experience there because one of my irrational thoughts was that if I told people that I was over it or told them that I was even going through the program yeah. to get over it or that I even had the fear in the first place that they would challenge me to things and then I wouldn't be able to handle it. Mm. So I was very hesitant, even though I knew I could, yeah. I was very hesitant to say, 
I'm over it now. I've, I'm emetophobia free because I, in my mind, thought people would go, okay, mm-hmm. then let's go and eat some chicken or let's go and whatever yeah. else. And I knew that I could, but I didn't want the pressure, mm-hmm. if that made sense, yeah. from yeah. other people. And I think the the drive to prove it to myself was a lot stronger than other people. Yeah. And I've got to, you know, I got to the point where I was like, well, I don't actually need to prove it to anybody else because I know, yeah. I know that I can do whatever I want to do with my life. I can eat chicken and I can do this and I can do that. But I did it very quietly, yeah. I guess, because of the social anxiety aspect to it. Mm. Um, I did it very quietly so that I could just be as internal with it as possible and sort of go, you know what, I I know that I can do this myself. I don't need to prove it to anybody. And actually, it's nice. It's like a little cherry on top, a little bonus when somebody goes, crikey, you've just done that. You would never have been able to do that. But it wasn't something that I was going, look, I can do it. I'll go and sort it out. I just did it really quietly, if that makes sense. Whether that was a hang, yeah, whether that was a hangover of social anxiety or not, I'm not entirely sure. But like you say, feeling really internal and really powerful about it. and Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, but it is nice. It's it's always a nice feeling when you deal with something. Because I remember a year or so ago, no longer than that now, crikey, it was before my daughter was born. I wasn't sick because I was sick when my daughter was born. But I was, before that, I felt really sick. I felt on the edge of being sick. Not anxiety, I just felt really sick. And I smashed the way I handled it I was just yeah. so pleased with myself but there was nobody else around my husband yeah. was out yeah. I was just so calm and yeah. so pleased with how I was able to just stay calm mm-hmm. and ride yeah. it out and if I'm sick I'm sick and that's fine there was no panic there was no yeah. worry I was just able to handle it and that like you say floating home I floated through like a week after yeah. that I was like <laughs> I can sit even if I I could do this yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely yeah. feeling yeah. it's really nice and I think that's yeah, the thing, absolutely. isn't it? Like, as a teacher, you're so, like, you feel like you're not only necessarily having to have that desire for control, but you are managing so many things that come up yes. all the time and uncomfortable yes. things and things that are yes. challenging. You're having to do that all day long is to think about yeah. how you manage your reactions. And it's really nice to feel that you can do that on that one thing that yeah. you just didn't think you would be able to. Absolutely. I think that's Absolutely. a big thing. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Yeah. It really is. So do you want to talk a little bit about doing Thrive in School before we have a little few tips for teachers? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as I said, I did the programme in 2020 in the summer holidays, came back. That was when we were fully back in classrooms after the first lockdown. Yeah. And it was really clear that there was lots of kind of mental health support that was needed. To be honest, teaching in a school which is full of creative and performing arts students, they're they're very, which is great, they're very kind of vocal about how they're feeling about things. Absolutely. It's a good thing. So there's always been that. And our school has always been good at at supporting mental health. There's, we've got a kind of full-time counselling service. um, But there's just so much need that they're very stretched and because a lot of external services have had kind of cuts there's nowhere really for them to to kind of it takes a long time for people to kind of be passed on to somewhere else if they need more support so um I just kind of said to school actually I think this would be a really nice thing for us for our students I think it would fit in well with our school um it's very much about kind of you know kind of positive reinforcement that kind of thing you know all those things that we we do so well at the school um and um so I said I would recommend maybe just looking into it because I think they you know they might kind of do something for young people and so the pastoral department and senior leadership team looked into it and then decided actually to invest in it. And, you know, we're really Thanks. brilliant in investing in that. So in the post-Christmas lockdown, when we had that other lockdown. Yeah, <laughs> we all take two. Again, in the depth of winter, um, <laughs> we, they took 30 members of staff. And then I joined in as well, okay. just to kind of, you know, see those sessions um, through online. Um, in, so we had kind of weekly sessions to, to kind of brilliant. do that in groups. So groups of 10. Yeah three groups of 10 um and then they said we'll have a role as well for somebody um to you know kind of coordinate and deliver thrive mm-hmm. in school so um i we, we, there was a um kind of there was a few people that applied for it because you know yeah. the, a lot of the staff that did it 
good, just got so much out of it. I um, did get that role, which I was fortunate about, (laughs) which I was pleased about rather, as I'd I'd kind of kicked it off really. Um, And um, the school put me through the coaching training, which is great, really. It's been a really nice investment for them to make and one I'm very grateful for because, you know, I know that school funding is, is, you know, at the moment. and so did my coaching training, started doing some, again, some delivery groups with staff right. alongside, yep. um, alongside Lucy Wood from Thrive, from the Thrive Programme. Nice. So kind of did a little bit of that as well. And then passed my training and and then have since been doing it in school. So I've been um, yeah. doing student groups, I've been doing staff groups. I've been doing um, PPD sessions, so putting together Lovely. things for 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 st- other staff to deliver. I've done some inset sessions, some parent groups, Fabulous. Uh, parent, group, parent sessions, yes. parent group, yeah. which I think would be really good. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I do that on one day, the equivalent of one day a week. So there's only Brilliant. a certain amount that you could do. It'd be it'd be great yeah. to do it to do it more. But um, I also have other things and and you know kind of finance is the 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 kind of thing there as well but um just a really good opportunity to be able to work with students at school you know I've had actually I've not had any emetophobics yet although I've got one I think that's going to be starting in my next group who's said right yeah I've got a metaphobia and I'd like to overcome it um but they've been there for mainly for kind of confidence reasons, for anxiety. I had one student who I teach as well, actually, and oh my gosh, just to see how he has thrived yeah. and grown in so many areas, not just to yeah. do with the anxiety that he had. He was very anxious of world events and what was going on and kind of right. seeing the news and hugely catastrophizing and, and yep. panicking and not knowing what to do, which I really understand that, you know, as a 14 really, year old. Yeah. You're seeing all this stuff. They've got so much access to yes, information, they do. but not yeah. the experience to be able to kind of pers- put it into perspective. Sometimes. Perspective, yeah. rationalise it. Yeah, the world, is, the world is scary at the moment, you know, in lots of ways. Yeah. But it's, you know, the, to the extent that he was worrying about it, yeah. wasn't helpful yeah. for him at all. So, no. um, he did the program, and he, you know, his mum's like, it's been a complete game changer for us at home Fabulous. to see how he is and to kind of yeah. know how he is. I, you know, teach as I said, I teach art, and it's quite a difficult subject. Lots of people take it thinking it's going to be very easy, but it's yeah. you know, lots of documentation yeah. and lots of work yeah. and lots of evidence to get a, a you know, one of the top yeah. higher grades. And he, um, when doing the programme, he was like, oh, I thought about that idea that you could just change the way you looked at something. He said, and I decided to take, to to replace fear that I had about whether I'd be able to do the work well enough to enjoyment. So now I just look at my artwork with enjoyment. And honestly, to see how his work has changed is amazing. Like that's a, that's been a really great thing. So, you know, it's been, it's been really good to do it in school and, I hope that continues for you know for a good while and that you know I can continue to work with those young people in that way because yes. working with them as a teacher is fantastic but being able to do that as well is a really nice um thing as well to complement absolutely that. there's such a place for it and there's such a need for it in young people yeah. even even through primary school as mm. as you know I I taught Thrive in the school that I was in for quite a while before I left and a massive impact for, for a variety of reasons. Again, no metaphobes yeah. <laughs> that I came across, but lots of self-esteem issues, lots of mm-hmm. perfectionism, actually, yeah. and that fear of failure. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the the social anxiety side of things and what people yeah. are going to think of me and I can't do this because of what they're going mm-hmm. to think. Loads of, of really good, impactful uh, stories from from students and there's such a need for it in young people because it's skills based and I know I bang on about this in in so many podcasts but the fact that it's skills really yeah. plays into our um forte as teachers doesn't it if we go oh this yeah. is something we can give yeah. to them <laughs> we can help them get these skills and we can nurture them yeah. we can help them practice it and it's just so child friendly almost yeah. because they can yeah. they can pick up tangible things that they can do mm. and get themselves through those mental health uh, issues that they're having so absolutely brilliant well yeah. thank you so much for coming on today claire it's been a real pleasure to talk to you um and i really enjoyed reminiscing about all those times yeah. <laughs> at school for myself it's been a long time since I've... Yeah, there we are. <laughs>
<laughs> since I've uh, thought about it. So thank you so much. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again on another podcast in yeah. the future. Lovely. Thanks, Michelle.